Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, thank you very much for the organizers. It has been an amazing week. I mean, I've been just overwhelmed with the, the quality of the talk and the diversity of it. And uh, I'd like to come back to, to Paul. Um, I know it has been pointed out by uh, the Vice President, Re uh, uh, Vice President Research at the beginning of the meeting, but I think it's, it's, it deserves to be mentioned a second time. I mean, it's just amazing that Paul has been named uh, Officer of the Order of Canada since the, the, the highest level of recognition that a citizen in Canada can get. So, Paul, congratulations again for this. <laughs> and <clears throat> I'd like to thank you also for having been the spark to build this such amazing community of, of biologists that we are today, just spanning all the diverse, taxonomic diversity for all kinds of application from all over the world. It's really the way to go, and I'm just very proud to be part of it and be a friend of yours. And um, I guess I'm just going to say that in your hunt for the next phase, her hunting for a little $2.5 billion, we'll be with you to chase for it. All right. So <clears throat> there's really two fundamental roles for molecular data in conservation genetics. Um, First one, we can refer to it as inventorial, which is about documenting patterns. And um, this is really what we have been doing for many years, uh, using more traditional methods, things like about taxonomic uncertainties, classic population structure, uh, uh, documenting patterns of hybridization, and so on and so on. Second aspect is more like mechanistic, which is about deciphering processes. And this is where we still have a lot to, uh, to learn about. For example, what is the gen genetic basis of local adaptation? What do we mean by evolutionary potential? Uh, how does that work, the genetic adaptation to captivity, et cetera, et cetera? And that's where uh, we're putting big, big hope in the use of modern genomics for conservation uh, biology. So basically, that stems from uh, three main points. Uh, first, uh, because it offers the potential to scale up genome coverage for any non-model species. And in doing so, improving estimates of population genetic and evolutionary parameters. <laughs> and as well, we, um, we hope to target markers that count uh, regulatory or uh, functional SNPs and going towards like a truly integrative approach, basically all the omics, if you want, towards elucidating the functional and adaptive significance of molecular variation. And ultimately, we want to do that to basically reach the, uh, the uh, holy grail of conservation genetics. So we'll get to the real stuff, which is finding causal relationship between genetic variation, phenotypes, and the environment to predict future dynamics of selectively important variation and potential for adaptation to new conditions. <laughs> so that's really ultimately where we, we want to, to head. So despite this huge potential offered by new, uh, new genomics, <laughs> There's currently concerns about how really applicable are these tools in the practical terms for conservation. So that's uh, highlighted here in this recent opinion in uh, Trees, uh, authored by uh, Aaron Schaefer and 35 uh, co-authors, actually, and basically expressing their concern that there's a, there's a serious gap between basic research being done in genomics and applicable solution for conservation uh, manager face with uh, multi-phase uh, problems. Uh, same kind of opinion has been expressed uh, recently also by uh, Hoglun uh, Group. <laughs> so basically uh, saying that despite this potential and a lot of studies being done on genomics, in terms of real application to conservation, there are very few concrete examples where genomics have made a uh, major impact. And uh, I guess this gap also in integrating genomics and in, uh, putting it into action, for example, in Canada, is illustrated by criteria guidelines for recognizing designable units uh, under uh, the Committee for Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada. So for example, the first step is to define discreteness, and this, uh, the, <laughs> the criteria are a population may be considered discrete based on neutral genetic marker, microsatellites, microsatellite, uh, RFLP, DNA sequences, so criteria that for me smells more like 2000 than 2015. Same thing about the, uh, the significance. Evidence that population differs in genetic characteristics tend to reflect relatively deep in trust-specific phylogenetic divergence. Such differences would typically be manifested as qualitative genetic differences, slow-evolving marker like mitochondrial DNA, alleles multiple nuclear loci. 
nothing wrong like that. It's just that the word genomics is just still totally absent in terms of the criteria to be used uh, to, uh, to define uh, designable units in Canada. <laughs> so actually, it's even stated in the, in the criteria that genetic distinctiveness by itself is not sufficient for a designable unit designation, nor is it necessary for this designable units to demonstrate genetic differences. So what's the role of genomics into that? It's not exactly totally clear. So something has to be changed, I guess. <laughs> okay, so the outline of my talk is very, very simple. Uh, it's basically just at least to, to dissect one case study that I've been involved in to illustrate how genomics can actually be successfully be used to address questions of applied relevance for management and conservation, <laughs> and as such bridging, bridging the gap between basic uh, research and applicable solution for conservation uh, managers. I was going to present more than one case studies and con construct, uh, contrasted studies, but I want to save some time to tell you <laughs> about uh, something quite different than genomics later on in the talk. So the, this type of study uh, that we're doing, we frame them into a conceptual framework. So basically, to, and it's, it's all about this basic question, how do species cope with occupying heterogeneous environments? So there's various possible solutions to this. The first one that comes to mind of everybody is local adaptation, which is about adaptive genetic structure matching the environment. But there are alternative solutions to local adaptation, obviously. <laughs> phenotypic plasticity, for example, different phenotypes expressed by the same genotype in different environmental conditions. But there's also a third one that we don't think about very often, <laughs> but I will illustrate the importance of this, uh, this process in the example, which is about specially varying selection, which is about local selection acting on polymorphism that is maintained by balancing selection, and this is reshuffle every, gen every generation. So you'll see by the example what I mean by that later on. So why is this important? This is important for properly defining the number and, ge of, and geographic scale of management and or evolutionary significant uh, units or designable units in Canada. For predicting how species can respond to either natural or anthropogenic changes. Uh, or for better understanding of how to manage genetic diversity in conservation strategies, including, for example, translocation uh, practices. So the uh, case study that I chose to present to you is work that we have been <laughs> doing on the um, population genomics and conservation of the American uh, eel, which has been a really uh, uh, real problem in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, puzzle, in terms of management and conservation. <laughs> so when it starts with the life cycle of, uh, and the distribution of, of eel, Many of you knows that, uh, that eel, both European, but here we're talking about the American eel, spawn right in the middle of the ocean in the Sargasso Sea and then larvae disperse through the Gulf Stream, first passively and eventually actively approaching the coast. And at, at, at some point eels come. That's maybe one fact that people don't know a lot about eel. They may decide if you want to, well, the classic thing is that they, they will enter freshwater, spend their life there and go back to the Sargasso Sea for reproduction, but they will also they may also decide to spend their entire life on coastal and brackish area, so salt water or fresh water. And they can do that either from Mexico all the way to nor northern Labrador. And so this is quite amazing. This is probably the fish species that has that's spent the most uh, uh, diversity of, of habitat of all, of all fishes. And on, on top of that, there's pronounced regional differences in phenotypes in terms of growth rate, mean, mean adult size and sex ratio, et cetera. That's, uh, an example of that here, that's the size distribution of adult size distribution of uh, eels from various locations. <laughs> so you can see, for example, that the mean uh, adult size in Rhode Island is much smaller than uh, the, the size of the adult size of the eels from the upper St. Lawrence River in Lake Ontario. And the sex ratio is very different as well. We only have 100% females in uh, eels coming up to Lake Ontario and upper St. Lawrence. And more intriguingly, so <laughs> every eel biologist until recently thought this is all plasticity, this is all influenced by the environment, but there has been some translocation transloca experiment being done, I'll explain why later, with glass eel. Glass eel are just the life stage that are just coming from the ocean, approaching the coast, uh, translocated from, from the maritimes, <laughs> so from the brackish water habitat, and uh, transferred to Lake Ontario. And what happened is that within a few years, instead of becoming these long-lived uh, large females, they started just to, uh, to mature, sexually mature, 
and uh, either males or females, and migrating down at, uh, at a much younger age, but being fast growing, but, uh, but mi migrating back like five years of age as opposed to 20 years of age. So the phenotype is strikingly different, and obviously it's not only the environment that has something to do in this, uh, in this pattern. So the, big, the question became, what is explaining the phenotypic and ecological variation in American eel? Is this an adaptive population structure? Is this pure phenotypic plasticity or genetic differences caused by specially varying selection? So very, or something else. So very, very puzzling. <coughs> but at the same time, from the conservation, uh, more uh, uh, aspects. So freshwater eel from the uh, genus Anguilla are in decline uh, worldwide. And uh, in terms of American eel, there's been dramatic decline over the last 35 years. But there's the, the, another part of the puzzle is that local recruitment, so the, the, the level of recruitment varies a lot geographically from one location to the other. <laughs> and for, namely, the decline has been most pronounced in the upper St. Lawrence and Lake Ontario. Actually, the decline has been like over 99% over the last 30 years, but it has not been the case on the, on the, in the maritime uh, provinces of Canada, not to that scale. <laughs> on top of that, there's an increasing demand uh, for American eel uh, in the face of the, um, of the European and Japanese eel fishery collapse. <coughs> so there's over 1,500 tons being fished in Canada every year. And the main market actually is for live glass eel, these, uh, these small transparent eel that are just coming from the ocean. And actually, this is the most pricey fish in the, in the world. This is being sold up to $3,000 uh, uh, per kilogram being sold for the, <coughs> for the farming industry uh, in Asia. So there's obviously huge economic pressure to, uh, to exploit those things. So clearly there was a need for, to better understand the causes of variable recruitment for improved management and a need to elucidate the cause and consequences of phenotypic and genetic variation throughout the species range. So to address these questions, <laughs> we were approached by, by uh, various uh, organizations uh, involved in management, fisheries and oceans, Great Lakes Fisheries Commissions, uh, provincial, uh, provincial agencies, and we got funding partly from INSERC, but also from these organizations to address uh, those questions that actually came from the managers. We did not make them up and go to them. So just again, the point is to illustrate the, the practical use of genomics for very applied uh, questions coming from the managers. So the first step <laughs> was to revisit rigorously the, the population structure in American eel. Of course, it's the classic case of panmixia, but the thing is that the real data was not with there. So we redone the whole thing, and basically that's, we got a beautiful negative result. That's my best negative result ever. Just FST, no genetic differentiation, whatever way you look at it. <laughs> so clearly, there's no local adaptation possible in this species because all, all eels belong to one single gene pool. So that was published in Molecular Ecology. So this is all about neutral markers. So then we went, <laughs> we'll see what about pos p potentially adapt variation at adaptive markers? So the way we approached it in the first step, we were interested to see if there was variation related to, uh, to some uh, environmental parameters, namely a sea surface temperature. So the way we approach the thing is that we perform uh, RNA-C to sequence the product of gene expression. So looking at variation in coding genes, and in the sequence of the, uh, of the sequence of, the, of these RNA, we identify a uh, uh, high number of SNPs. And the first step was to look at, uh, to look at the differences in two extreme uh, locations, Florida and this is Quebec in July, no, in January. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the distribution of, uh, of uh, level of variation for these uh, 13,000 uh, uh, SNPs. And some of those were like real outliers with very high level of differences between these two locations. So the strategy here was to select those markers and then, and then screen these uh, 75 outlier coding SNPs on many, many uh, glass seals from uh, many locations along, uh, along the Atlantic coast of uh, North America. So what we've seen is that out of these 75, we identified 12 genes, <laughs> coding genes, for which the allele frequency varies uh, with sea surface temperature. That's the illustration of, for one of the gene. And of course, in the, in, in the case of no population structure or no effect of selection as well, you would expect just no variation uh, associated with variation of sea surface uh, temperature. So overall, when we, we, we look at it like from a, a multi-locus perspective, we had this beautiful <laughs> clinal variation 
comprising like the variation of these 12 genes uh, as a function of sea surface temperature being encountered at each of these locations. So quite clearly, uh, this was a nice illustration of how specially varying selection can generate functional genetic differences between locations during the lifetime of these, uh, of these fish, despite the fact that they belong to a single genetic population. So it's kind of, took me three years to make that understand to the managers, but they got the point. Genetic differences in absence of genetic differences, you know. Okay, <laughs> so that was related to temperature. So then I mentioned that uh, eels can also spend part of their time uh, decide if you want to spend their life either in freshwater or in brackish uh, salt water. So <laughs> we were interested to answer this question as well. Does specially varying selection also cause genomic differentiation between freshwater versus saltwater uh, ecotypes? So we published this very recent in current biology. <laughs> so the way we approach that is we, uh, we compare uh, hundreds of eels from uh, some sampling sites, uh, either from uh, freshwater or in red from uh, salt brackish water. So you notice this red one here, so this, those are eels that were translocated within Lake Ontario from a salt water uh, site. And uh, you'll see that the pattern just, they just fit the pattern of actually where they come from, uh, from a genomic perspective. So now we scaled up, we scaled up, so we genotype over 40,000 SNP. So if you take the whole, uh, the whole SNP together, same thing, FST of zero, so no structure whatsoever between the, those sites. So then we use the random forest statistical al algorithm to search for a marker that could co-vary between ecotypes. <laughs> so out of these uh, 40,000 markers, we found like about 300, uh, 300 SNPs that were classified if you want, as most important and could be used to discriminate ecotypes uh, with a success of 90%. So basically, that's a, that's a heat, uh, heat plot here that shows how you can, we, the, the freshwater sites and the uh, brackish saltwater sites uh, kind of separate quite nicely together as a function of variation of these 300 uh, SNPs. And uh, <laughs> quite interestingly, so the, you see like groups of, uh, of markers that show striking differences in allele frequency. So basically, uh, what we observe is, um, we make it easier. So group of markers that, for, that became essentially fixed for a given allele uh, in, uh, in fresh water, whereas it, they were var these markers were variable in the saltwater environment, and some markers the other way around became fixed uh, in saltwater, uh, and whereas they were variable in the freshwater environment. And uh, we saw, so because we had some information on the annotation of those markers, so we saw an over-representation of the, like those markers that differed between the saltwater and the freshwater ecotypes, uh, where o there was an over-representation of function associated with early development related to respiratory system, uh, cardiac muscle tissue, et cetera, et cetera. So <laughs> taking all the evidence together, uh, including the previous uh, study on the, um, on the thermal gradient, uh, we showed that specially varying selection imposed by temperature and salinity gradient, uh, temperature and salinity gradient produce local functional genetic differences despite the panmixia, despite the fact there's a single a gene pool in the species. How does that work? <laughs> so basically, you have random mating in the Sargasso Sea. There's random dispersal of the larvae along the, along the coast, and they will occupy different type of ecological niches related to, let's say, temperature or, or salinity. And in each of these niches, there will be selection for different genotypes during the lifetime of the eel, which may be related with difference in the phenotypic variation associated with these different niches. So, so and then there will be migration back to the Sargasso Sea, random mating among these now genetically different and phenotypically different eels, and uh, the cycle will start uh, over uh, again. So overall, in eel, you see a pattern of phenotypic functional genetic structuring and patterns of recruitment that are just totally comparable to locally adapted population that you would see in other species. But here, this is reshuffle every generation. So the consequences of that for, uh, for conservation, so basically we had two major recommendations to the managers. First, you need to manage globally because there's a, a single gene pool for the whole species. The persistence of the whole species depends on the demography and genetic diversity of a single gene pool. So air restoration in a given location could benefit from improved conservation measures applied elsewhere because there's a total demographic connectivity in the species. But also, you need to think locally 
<laughs> because some local management practice must take the existence of these local genetic differences into account that develop during the lifetime of, uh, of a given generation. So if eels colonizing different waters are not genetically homogeneous, stocking eels from different origins could have negative impact or fail to reach desired objective, for instance, in impairing the association between life history characteristics and habitat preference. So one concrete application of these results is that they were going, managers were going to be big in terms of translocation from where the eels are still more abundant to stock the upper St. Lawrence Lake, Ontario, and obviously they just totally quit the, this translocation program <laughs> because this was not going anywhere uh, in regard to the, um, to the goals that, uh, uh, that they were targeting. So, <laughs> anyway, so that's an, ex an, an illustration that um, genomics can do something useful and very, in be very practical and applicable in, uh, in real conservation context. <laughs> but um, I'd say that, uh, but there's still gap, there's still, there's still work to be done to, to uh, sell the relevance and to really put uh, genomics into applied action. But it's a trivial problem compared to other problems I think that we have in Canada right now. And I'd like to spend the rest of my talk to tell you a little bit about this. So um, basically over the last few years, uh, scientists in Canada have been very concerned by several things. Uh, concerned about the way science is being funded, sci about how science is being oriented, and how science is being used in, in Canada. <laughs> so this was important enough <laughs> for triggering this march that where 2,000 scientists walk on the government hill back in 2012 to express their concern that we are concerned about the way science is being used and treated in, in Canada. <laughs> Famous scientists of Canada expressed their concern as well. David Schindler, uh, one of the, uh, an icon, a legend of aquatic, biologist, uh, aquatic biology in Canada, <laughs> to quote him, it's like they don't want to hear about science anymore. They want politics to reflect economics, 100% economics being only what you can sell that we can say, what you can save. <laughs> Former president of the Canadian Society of Ecology and Evolution, Jeff Hutchings, expressed also his concern, saying that freedom of expression is no longer a right enjoyed by Canadian government scientists. When you inhibit communication in science, you inhibit science. When you inhibit science, you inhibit acquisition of knowledge. So actually, <laughs> if I can summarize the, the plan there has been drastic changes to science in Canada in recent years, which have been happening in three distinct strategic ways. The first one being to reduce the ability of government scientists to communicate their research to the public. Has been over the press all over the place, as uh, shown in this uh, quote from the Globe and Mail. It's pretty clear for that for the federal scientists, Ottawa decides now if the researchers can talk, what they can talk about, and when they can say it. <laughs> the last example, uh, the, the most recent example of that Steve Campana, a real famous uh, marine biologist in Canada, <laughs> just expressed his disgust about government muzzling and basically just decided to resign and move to Iceland, period. <laughs> uh, scientists have uh, put this organization together, evidence for democracy to, <laughs> to have a voice and express how concerned we are. And uh, so basically the one thing that the evidence for democracy has done is to um, evaluate the, uh, the, evaluate the um, possibility of, uh, of scientists in various ministries and organizations uh, at the government to uh, express and speak about their, what they're doing to the public. And they quoted, <laughs> they quoted on, the, on the A to, uh, to F, F being like lousy, and A would be, there's not that many A's in there, right? <laughs> so actually, they came up with 85% 80, of the ministries didn't pass uh, were below like this, uh, a C in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, their potential for freedom of speech uh, to, uh, to, can to Canadians. Not very good. If you're a student, that's not good. <laughs> okay, second way uh, that uh, things have, have, been, uh, have been happening, eroding of Canada's basic science uh, capa uh, capacity. The prime example of, of that has been the dismantling of the world-famous experimental lakes area a couple of years ago. And this, this was like an icon of aquatic biology. That's where we learned about uh, the crucial evidence for the effects of acid grades back in the 80s, 
about how the phosphates from detergent cause algal blooms, uh, <laughs> the impact of, uh, of mercury on fish, and so on and so on. And it just happened ELA was costing only $2 million a year to maintain, but research, probably research, well, not probably, research done uh, there probably saved governments around the world billions of dollars by preventing water contamination from the knowledge that was acquired from that facility. This has been shut down. <laughs> Fortunately, it has been more recently rescued by the government of Ontario. Many other examples of that. <laughs> Shutting down Pearl, the Polar Environment uh, Atmospheric Research Lab, closing of DFO Ecological, Eco, Ecotoxicology Lab and contaminants monitoring capacity all over the country, disappearance of seven out of 11 DFO libraries throughout the country. That's pretty dramatic. <laughs> so actually, more than 2,000 scientists lost their job over the last few years. Hundreds of research programs and facilities lost their funding as well. So basically, for me, it's obvious that we went from the Enlightenment years to the great darkness. So things have to be changed. <laughs> the, third, the third way that things have been, um, the way that uh, change to science in Canada, uh, that things have happen happening has been to re towards reducing the role of evidence in policy uh, decision. <laughs> and that relates more directly, if you want, to conservation than the previous one, but all links together. And uh, the best uh, illustration of that is the, has been the, uh, the gutting of the Fisheries Act, which was a, a law that was very strong in protecting freshwater uh, uh, aquatic habitat in Canada. So basically, <laughs> this, uh, this law has been seriously amended, such that today, habitat, uh, whereas habitats of any fish before was prote being protected by this act, now habitat are protected only for fish that are considered part of a fishery or that support a fishery. In other words, a fish is not a fish anymore. A fish is something that you exploit, period. So that means that 80% of species at risk of extinction have lost their protection in Canada. Fish inhabiting waters not regularly visited by humans are no longer warrant protection under this uh, new version of the law. <laughs> it just happened that most of Canada is pretty empty. So, <laughs> so that speaks for itself. And quite illogically, I mean, applying the law as it is right now may prioritize habitat protection in some cases for some non-native species and even hatch reproduce hybrids because they are exploited, so they deserve to be protected even if they are hatch reproduce hybrids. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Sure. Oh, you're starting to speak French. That's right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, and there has been, uh, so there has been change in many, uh, many other laws uh, uh, as well. Uh, one very important thing is that it is now the National Energy Board that, uh, that is the lead ag agency in determining issues that relate to the Species at Risk Act and Fisheries Act. So there may be some sort of conflict of interest there. And uh, so those changes are not supported by scientific advice. And this is inconsistent with an ecosystem-based uh, approach of management. But who get the benefits out of this? That's a big question. But I guess we know the answer. So a hint of that is that recently uh, there has been an ex-pipeline lobbyist being nominated on the National Energy uh, Board, so there could be perhaps some conflict of interest there. And uh, more strikingly illustrated by this letter that can be found uh, on the website, if you want, that was written by presidents of major uh, oil and pipeline association to the Minister of, uh, of Environment and Minister of Natural Resources Canada, basically uh, <laughs> bringing to their attention that the existing legislation is outdated and asking for some changes in this legislation in some of those very laws that were so important for, for habitat protection, Species at Risk Act, uh, the Fisheries Act, and so on and so on. And they end up the letter by wishing a happy holiday season. You may as well add a little Mickey Mouse next to it to make it very gentle. So I'll leave you, so the, the point is that I think it's good that you know that everything is not perfect in Canada and for Canadians, I think it's good that <laughs> You should, uh, you should let your family and let your neighbors and let your, your friends know that uh, maybe the, their tax money is not being used the most, in the most optimal way. And to finish, I'll leave you with uh, the words of Gro Harlem Brotland, the former, uh, former uh, prime minister of Norway. Politics that disregards scientific knowledge will not stand the test of time. <laughs> if we compromise on scientific facts and evidence, repaying nature will be enormously costly if possible at all. I'm really looking forward to hear Prime Minister in Canada saying just those words.
Thank you very much.